There are millions of researchers dedicated to understanding the natural world. But even with countless hours of research being performed every day, there are still questions that we cannot answer. In this video, we're looking at five unsolved mysteries from the natural world. In 1835, when Charles Darwin visited Isla Floriana in Ecuador's Galapagos Islands, he encountered a small, undescribed species of rail. It was later described as Darwin's rail, or the Galapagos Crake, and it's a tiny, dark species with short wings and a strong, slightly downcurved bill. It was found in the damp grasslands, fern thickets, and stream edges on Floriana, but once humans arrived, it didn't last for long. Not long after Darwin's visit, the crake disappeared from Floriana, and while it has survived on a few other islands in the archipelago, its loss on Floriana was still concerning. Floriana has since become one of the most heavily altered islands in the Galapagos. It has a permanent human settlement, and with humans come cats, rats, and other invasive animals that have preyed on small birds and their eggs. In fact, Floriana has suffered some of the highest rates of local extinction in the archipelago, with a long list of native species having already been lost. From October to December of 2023, Floriana became the focus of an ambitious restoration effort. Cats and rodents were targeted in a large-scale eradication program designed to give native wildlife a chance to recover. It was one of the most comprehensive attempts to undo the damage of two centuries of introduced predators, and it seems to have worked, because in 2025, something extraordinary happened. Field teams discovered not just a single wandering bird, but evidence of an entire population of Darwin's rail on Floriana. The species, which had been absent for almost 200 years, had suddenly reappeared. But how? This is a question that researchers are still trying to answer. One possibility is that the birds managed to recolonize the island, with rails possibly dispersing from nearby islands once the invasive predators were removed. But the other, more intriguing possibility is that a tiny, hidden population had clung on in some overlooked corner of the island, surviving undetected and unable to expand because of the introduced predators. But now that these were gone, they were finally able to recolonize new parts of Floriana. Either way, the return of the Galapagos Crake to Floriana is a rare reversal of an island extinction that didn't involve direct human reintroduction. Geography generally determines how far a species can range. Species in the Americas tend to be related to other American species, while those in the Old World form their own separate branches. Over millions of years, oceans and continents have kept most lineages largely confined to their side of the planet, and iguanas are a perfect example of this pattern. They're overwhelmingly a New World group, spread across Central America and South America, as well as many of the islands of the Caribbean. Their ability to colonize these islands is already impressive, but because the islands sit close to the American mainland, that kind of spread is fairly common across the Caribbean. But on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, on the islands of Fiji and Tonga, there exists a group of strange lizards that don't seem to belong there. The Fiji iguanas live more than 8,000 kilometers from the Americas, with four different species surviving today. Genetic studies of the banded and crested Fiji iguanas of the genus Brachylophus have shown that they are in fact true iguanids, closely related to iguanas from the New World, rather than to Asian or Australian lizards found much nearer by. But how did they get there? For a long time, researchers tried to explain their presence with lost land bridges or ancient connections between continents. But Fiji and its surrounding islands are volcanic, not fragments of old continents and the timing never lines up in a way that would let iguanas simply walk onto these pieces of land. And that means that something far more dramatic likely happened. The leading explanation today is that iguanas from the Americas 
across the Pacific on floating rafts of storm-torn vegetation long ago, carried out to sea by floods or cyclones, and pushed across the ocean by powerful currents. Iguanas are tough, slow-metabolizing herbivores, and among the few reptiles that might survive such a long journey over the sea. In 2025, new genetic evidence linked the Fiji iguanas most closely to iguana lineages from North America, specifically the desert iguana lineage from the southwestern United States and northwestern Mexico, and they seem to have diverged anywhere from 31 to 34 million years ago, suggesting that their ancestors made this crossing right around the time that Fiji's islands first rose from the sea. But this is just a hypothesis. What actually happened may never be known, and their presence in the Western Pacific remains one of the most improbable stories of natural animal distribution in the world. In 1855, naturalist John McGillivray came across an immature specimen of petrel on Gao Island in Fiji. It was deposited in the British Museum in London and described as the Fiji petrel, but then it seemingly disappeared. In 1922, a search team failed to relocate the birds, and a confirmed sighting of a second individual didn't come until over a century after the first bird was recorded. In the mid-1960s, a few unverified sightings of the birds surfaced from sailors around Gao, and in 1965, a single bird was confirmed from the island after it was attracted to some lights. More searches were launched in the 1970s, but each failed to find another Fiji petrel. Finally, in 1983, a new search was launched that saw the bird rediscovered in 1984 when a Fiji petrel was finally captured and photographed for the first time. By this point, it was clear that the bird wasn't just a rare species, but one on the very edge of extinction. Since its rediscovery, the Fiji petrel has been recorded just around 20 times. Most of those encounters involve single birds that fly to lights at night on the island of Gao, as well as a few rare sightings at sea. It's estimated that fewer than 50 individuals likely survive, making it one of the most endangered species on Earth. Despite this, it's become an important symbol in Fiji, appearing on the country's banknotes as a reminder of the nation's fragile natural heritage. But the Fiji petrel isn't just mysterious because of how few of them seem to be left, but also because we still don't know where exactly they breed. Almost all evidence points to Gao Island as its stronghold, yet no one has ever found a burrow where the species nests. Without knowing where it breeds, conservationists can't directly protect the birds during one of the most vulnerable and important parts of their life cycle. At one point, scientists began searching the steep forested cliffs where the birds were suspected to nest but the work was halted out of fear that even careful human activity might disturb the remaining breeding birds, or even open paths for invasive predators to reach them. It's a rare case of conservation efforts being scaled back because the very effort to save the species risked being what pushed it closer to extinction. The Fiji petrel remains a mystery. We know it's tied somehow to Gao Island, but the nesting burrows are yet to be discovered making this what BirdLife International calls one of the greatest mysteries in seabird conservation. In late August 1976, a school headmaster named Mabalo Lokela in northern Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, walked into a small mission hospital in Yambuku with what looked like a bad case of malaria. He was treated and sent home, but within days, he returned, violently ill with vomiting, diarrhea, and bleeding. He died within days, and what no one understood at the time was that this wasn't a previously documented illness, but the start of something horrific that no one had ever seen before. Within weeks, the illness was tearing through families and hospital staff in Zaire. At almost the same time, a similar outbreak erupted in southern Sudan, starting around Nzara and spreading to Maridi. 
By the time international teams arrived and samples were tested, it was clear that this was not malaria, not typhoid, and not Marburg, but a new virus, one that was later named after the Ebola River. Over the last 50 years, there have now been around 40 Ebola outbreaks, causing nearly 16,000 deaths across a dozen countries. And despite years of research, there's still one major question about the virus. Where did it come from in the first place? The virus couldn't have appeared out of nowhere. The first human case in an outbreak almost certainly catches the virus from some species of animal before spreading from person to person. But what animal carries Ebola in nature, quietly and continuously, between these outbreaks? Early on, investigators looked at all the obvious suspects. Primates were an easy one because outbreaks sometimes followed contact with dead apes in the forest. But later, major die-offs were noticed in gorillas and chimpanzee populations, and these were also linked to Ebola. So if great apes also die from the virus, they couldn't have been the virus's normal carriers. The suspicion then moved strongly towards bats. Bats can host viruses without obvious illness, and multiple studies have found Ebola-related evidence in bats, especially fruit bats, suggesting that they might be involved in the natural cycle. And a story from the 2010s seems to confirm this theory. From 2013 to 2016, there was an outbreak in West Africa. Investigators traced the likely first human case to a two-year-old boy in Meliandu, Guinea, who died early in the epidemic. The people of the town said that the children of the village, including this boy, regularly played inside a large hollow tree that was packed with bats. When researchers arrived months later to investigate, the tree was gone. The villagers said it had burned in March of 2014, and that the burning produced a rain of bats, which were promptly collected and consumed by those who witnessed it. The loss of the hollow tree and the bat colony meant that researchers were unable to determine what species of bat it was, and they never got the chance to test the colony for the possible presence of Ebola. So the mystery remains. We can map outbreaks and we can sequence the virus, but the specific origin point in nature and how Ebola crosses into human populations remain unknown. Silphium might be the most famous plant that no one can identify. It once grew only in a narrow strip of land around the ancient Greek city of Cyrene, in what is now eastern Libya. Ancient writers described it as a tall, fennel-like plant with a hollow stalk, thick roots covered in dark bark, and golden celery-like leaves. Theophrastus, often called the father of botany, described its roots as being about a cubit long, which is close to half a meter, showing that this was a plant people knew in detail. And it was far more than just some wild herb. Silphium was one of the most valuable natural products in the ancient Mediterranean world. Its resin, known as laser, was used as medicine, as a flavoring, as an aphrodisiac, and as a preservative. It was so important that the city of Cyrene stamped its image onto their coins, and it appears again and again in art and literature. The playwright Antiphanes even wrote a joke about saying goodbye to a life dominated by Silphium. I will not sail back to the place from which we were all carried away, for I want to say goodbye to all. Horses, Silphium, chariots, Silphium stalks, steeplechasers, Silphium leaves, and Silphium juice. Silphium was so important that some researchers have even suggested that an ancient Minoan hieroglyph, Psi, may have been inspired by it, showing just how important it really was in Mediterranean culture. But for a plant that was so important for so long, it disappeared suddenly. According to the Roman writer Pliny, by the first century, Silphium was already considered lost. He tells the story of a final stock being found and sent to the Emperor Nero, as if it were a curiosity from a lost world. Despite everything we know about the plant, from ancient depictions and texts, we still don't know what species it really was. So what could Silphium have been? 
One possibility is that it truly was a unique species that went extinct. It had an incredibly small native range of only about 11,300 square kilometers in the southern steppe of Cyrenaica. This part of modern-day Libya has changed dramatically over the centuries. What was once rich African grassland has succumbed to desertification, and perhaps the plant just couldn't adapt fast enough. The species was also harvested intensely. It was considered an herb that everyone needed to have in their homes because of its many uses, and the high cost of silphium may have made its harvest irresistible. If it did go extinct, some combination of overgrazing, desertification, and human pressure could have wiped it out quickly, making silphium one of the first plant extinctions ever historically recorded as it happened. Another possibility is that it isn't truly gone, but that it's an extant species that we've just failed to identify yet. Botanists have tried to match silphium to living plants, and at least five different species of giant fennel have been put forward. But every candidate doesn't quite align with what we know about silphium. The main issue is geography, as none of these has ever been known to naturally grow where silphium was supposed to have lived, in Cyrenaica. There is one other proposed theory, that silphium may have been a hybrid variety that only existed in horticulture. If it was a hybrid, it would have most likely been sterile and would have depended on people to repeatedly cross two parent plants in order to recreate it. But if the knowledge of the two parent plants was lost, silphium would have potentially vanished quickly, even if its parents still exist somewhere today. In modern times, silphium remains a symbol linked to Cyrenaica, appearing on at least two different Libyan coat of arms, but its true identity is still a mystery. And that's it for this week's video. What other unsolved mysteries from nature have you heard of? Let me know in the comments below. I need to say a special thanks to my patrons and YouTube members. Without their ongoing support, I wouldn't be able to make a video like this every week. If you want to support the channel, consider joining us on Patreon. The link is in the video description below. Or become a member here on YouTube by hitting the join button below the video. Members also get early access to videos as well as exclusive perks like special badges and custom emojis to use in the comments. Your support helps me to keep making the best content that I can. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.